Okay. Assalamualaikum warahmatullahi wabarakatuh. Hmm, sounds like I haven't got the energy yet from this classroom. Shall I repeat the salam again? Assalamualaikum warahmatullahi wabarakatuh. Well, that's the energy. Thank you. Um, I would like to first of all say good afternoon and welcome, everybody. Um, thank you for being here with us today. Uh, first of all, I would like to say my warmest greeting to Prof. Endang uh, and then the Vice Dean, Ibu Asistiarini, uh, fellow lecturers uh, from the Department of Nutrition, uh, Faculty of Public Health, um, Bapak Ote Santika. <laughs> Uh, Senior Director Advisor from Vitamin Angels Indonesia. My name is Fatima Sulistiwati Sigit. Uh, I am a lecturer from the Department of Nutrition, and I am very honored today to be your uh, Master of Ceremony and Moderator for today's guest lecture. We are gathered here in this very special and rare occasion because among us, there is already a world-renowned scientist in nutrition, Professor Keith West. <laughs> Yeah, uh, today we are uh, lucky because we get the opportunity to listen to an inspiring talk by Professor Keith. But before we get to listen to the talk, I would like to first invite Professor Endang to give uh, an opening speech and also to open this event officially. Oh, <laughs> okay. The time and floor is yours, Professor. Thank you. Terima kasih. Assalamualaikum warahmatullahi wabarakatuh. Adik-adik semua, saya nggak tahu apa pernah lihat saya ya. Anaknya di, di Zoom ya. Baik, hari ini kita beruntung uh, untuk, terima kasih sebelumnya Ibu Wakil Dekan, Ibu Asih, Ibu Trini, Ibu Helda, dari Apit ya. Oke. Okay. Dan mbak semuanya, semua, serta teman-teman sekalian ada Bu Arifa, ada beberapa teman dari Gisi juga, serta adik-adik semuanya. Assalamualaikum warahmatullahi wabarakatuh. Hari ini kita beruntung karena kita eh, apa namanya mendapat kunjungan dari Profesor Keith West eh, dari Johns Hopkins University. Jadi beliau itu mungkin sudah pernah ada yang mendengar program suplementasi vitamin A. Dua kali seminggu, eh, dua kali setahun, program atau kebijakan tersebut kemudian secara global eh, diambil oleh eh, apa direkomendasikan oleh WHO untuk diberikan kepada semua anak balita umur 6 sampai 59 bulan. Nah, waktu itu penelitian di Aceh merupakan penelitian pertama yang dipimpin oleh Profesor Alfred Sommer sebagai orang pertama dan beliau Prof Kifes ini orang keduanya. Jadi beliau pernah di Aceh tahun 82 84 sebagai e, artinya yang memimpin di lapangan waktu itu. Kemudian beliau juga memimpin studi-studi lainnya yang hampir sama di berbagai dunia lainnya, kalau nggak salah 5 atau 6 negara lainnya untuk lebih kurang semacam memvalidasi apakah bukti yang di Aceh itu uh, didukung oleh penelitian di negara lain. Ternyata iya. Ya, jadi artinya pada waktu itu uh, temuannya itu bahwa uh, vitamin A itu tidak hanya menurunkan risiko kebutaan pada anak-anak, tetapi juga menurunkan uh, risiko kesak kesakitan dan kematian. Dalam perjalanannya uh, penyakit infeksi pada balita, Vitamin A merupakan salah satu yang menyebabkan, selain yang lain ya, yang menyebabkan angka kematian balita itu turun dalam dekade tersebut. Nah, saya terus terang bertemu beliau tahun 84 pada waktu kami sama-sama mahasiswa S3, right? 84. Uh, tapi beliau sudah lebih maju daripada saya waktu itu, uh, tahun 84. Dan kami pernah bersama-sama bernyanyi, nyakit ya. Bungong Jempa, beliau main gitar, saya main piano. Gitu ya waktu itu di aula seperti ini dihadiri oleh lebih dari 400 siswa Johns Hopkins waktu itu. 
lumayan berhasil ya. Jadi uh, itu sejarahnya. Nah sekarang Prof Keith West itu tidak berhenti untuk tetap bekerja di mikronutrien. Uh, sekarang beliau bekerja yang di bidang baru, aset proteinomik. Proteinomik jadi uh, melihat bahwa suatu uh, protein ternyata juga ada, ada kaitannya dengan zat gizi tertentu. Protein-protein itu banyak ratusan, mungkin dibuan ya, ada jenisnya dan itu ternyata terkait dengan eh, apa? Dengan mikronutrien tertentu, sehingga ada kemungkinan suatu saat nanti kita bisa melihat defisiensi mikronutrien itu berdasarkan vitamin eh, berdasarkan proteinnya, ya kan? Artinya eh, karena mikronutrien itu biasanya mahal. Jadi kalau kita memeriksa protein, berbagai jenis protein, kita bisa punya prediksi kira-kira mikronutrien apa lainnya yang eh, apa yang rendah berdasarkan pemeriksaan berbagai jenis protein tersebut. Nah, yang ingin saya katakan adalah bahwa eh, Prof. Kiswet ini eh, bekerja menunjukkan bagaimana sebetulnya ruang lingkup public health. Jadi public health itu tidak hanya sekedar program, tidak hanya sekedar manajemen, tidak hanya sekedar kebijakan, tapi merupakan program intervensi kebijakan yang didasarkan pada temuan di tatanan sangat mikro. Ya, jadi keep in mind adik-adik di sini ya bahwa kita public health itu bukan soal manajemen saja. Semua kebijakan kita itu didasarkan pada temuan pada tatanan yang sangat mikro, molekul dari molekul ke jutaan manusia atau satu molekul ke jutaan molekul atau satu molekul ke penyelamatan jutaan manusia. Itu adalah public health. Ya. Jadi semoga tetap mencintai public health karena kita tidak bisa melakukan intervensi tanpa pemahaman yang komprehensif dari tatanan yang mikro kemudian menengah, makro, dan seterusnya, klinik, dan kemudian e, populasi. Ya, jadi e, itulah public health. Nah, itu yang bisa saya sampaikan tentang Prof. Keith West. Jadi beliau ini sampai sekarang masih, beliau itu juga e, pernah menjabat sebagai e, direktur untuk apa program GISI di Johns Hopkins. Beliau juga e, profesor, I forgot profesor, it's Graham, right? Grandem? Grandem profesor. Ya, yeah. oke. Okay. Jadi beliau dan beliau juga Ibu Keith West juga adalah profesor biostatistik. Uh, I think uh, so much about you. I think uh, Ibu Asih, would you like to say something? Oke. Okay. Jadi selamat mendengarkan. Semoga kita hari ini belajar uh, contoh ilmu public health yang sangat luas dari mikro, dari molekul ke jutaan. Jiwa, ya. Terima kasih. Wassalamualaikum warahmatullahi wabarakatuh. Welcome. Oke. Okay. Uh, thank you very much, Prof. Endang, for uh, the opening speech. Uh, now that Prof. Endang mentioned about Bungung Jempa, <laughs> I'll propose that after the lecture, we will hear uh, Professor Keith singing Bungung Jempa. Everybody agree? <laughs> after the lecture, okay? Uh, so maybe a bit to uh, introduce the audience to you, Professor. So the audience here is the undergraduate and postgraduate students from our nutrition program. So they are here and also from public health program, Professor. So they are excited to see uh, and listen to your lecture. But uh, before I invite Professor Key to the stage, uh, I would like to uh, please allow me to uh, mention a bit of uh, your CV. So Professor Keith West is a professor and program director in human nutrition at John Hopkins uh, Bloomberg School of Public Health. Uh, Prof uh, professor Keith uh, was also studying at the John Hopkins University for his Master of Public Health and also Doctor of Public Health program. And among other things, Professor Keith's research interest is in vitamin A and vitamin E de deficiency. Uh, maternal health and also children health, including in low and middle income countries, including Indonesia. And also a short but interesting fact uh, from Pro Professor Keith is that in 1980s and 1990s, Professor Keith 
was actually conducting studies about uh, vitamin A supplementation uh, in Indonesia. And actually, that study is uh, the one that really supports and actually one of the most driving uh, force for the national supplementation program of vitamin A. So if you student receive vitamin A capsules uh, when you're still babies from Poshandu or Puskesmas or any local community health center, that is partially thanks to Professor Keith over here. <laughs> Okay, without further ado, I will invite Professor Keith. Please, Professor. How do I end this? Thank you, Dr. Fatima. You are an example of how successful vitamin A was. So it is very, very nice to be here with you today. Salamat siang. Uh, um, it is a pleasure to be at FKM and to see all of you and to be able to um, speak to you today about uh, nutrition, about vitamin A deficiency prevention in particular, but hopefully there are some general lessons uh, to learn as well about, uh, about nutrition research, excuse me, and uh, the role of a public health researcher uh, in doing research, analyzing the data, coming up with findings, and when the evidence is strong enough to be an advocate for public health interventions and change. <coughs> excuse me, I'm just going to get a drink of water here. I'm nervous. So it is um, in nutrition research, you also want to also always be thinking about biological plausibility. Uh, when you do epidemiological research, you're looking for associations, and you'll see some really striking examples in some of the slides. Uh, those associations <coughs> for morbidity or mortality are not causal until you put the intervention to a trial and can demonstrate that there is an impact uh, on an outcome, whether it's morbidity, mortality, growth, cognition, whatever it may be. And uh, it is our also our responsibility <coughs> to provide the biological pathways that as as much as we can, as far as we can, to explain the the uh, to provide some rationale for <clears throat> All of a sudden, I got caught. <coughs> I think what I need. <clears throat> These are great. <clears throat> they clear up your head. <clears throat> so I'm not sure what happened just now. Um, got something in my throat. <clears throat> okay, is it coming back? Maybe. Uh, okay, so. If I can't talk throughout the whole talk, we will let the data speak for itself. 
Uh, so there's a there there is the need to provide biological plausibility to explain. You have to be able to explain the impact, <clears throat> especially to those outer circles of colleagues and constituencies <clears throat> that may not know about the nutrient of interest, in this case, vitamin A, <clears throat> or the nutrition intervention, or may not know the biology of nutrition so that you need to explain those mechanisms in order to provide convincing evidence. Another issue is our human biology is very complex. And in public health, our challenge is to take the complexity of biology, of our human biology, <clears throat> and try to make it as simple as possible, but not simpler. Uh, and that finding that spot of how you can engage policymakers, politicians, funding agencies, those groups that are not in nutrition to understand the problem the solution, and to share the importance of moving ahead with a program is all part of our job <clears throat> as public health nutritionists. So the vitamin A story is really an interesting one because this country has actually demonstrated the leadership uh, in how to move a nutritional problem of severe consequence all the way to prevention and provide examples to the world on uh, not only one or two trials, <clears throat> but with respect to many aspects of um, uh, vitamin A research that has gone to policy in one way or another, and some research that has not yet gone to policy and needs further, either further research or further uh, program action. Okay. Boy, this stuff is really good. It goes right through your head into your eyes. Wow. We don't have that. I don't think we sell fishermen's in the States. I may buy like 50 packets of it. Okay. So we're going to talk about vitamin A. And I'm going to advance. Do I point it over here? There it goes. So this problem of vitamin A deficiency is an ancient one. Does anybody here read hi uh, hieroglyphics? No. Oh, too bad. Okay. Well, this says right here, when you have night blindness, it should be treated with ox liver that you squeeze into the eye and then you tell the patient to eat the liver, which is the source of vitamin A, of course. As promoted by Hippocrates uh, in the fourth century, this was a papyrus that was, un, that was found in the 1800s. But on the, on the causeway to the pyramid at Saqqara in Egypt, the oldest pyramid, there is also hieroglyphics depicting night blindness. <clears throat> And that could only be due to vitamin A deficiency. And there is strong biological plausibility for why that is so. <clears throat> this is Professor E.V. McCullum. Um, he was our first nutritionist at Johns Hopkins uh, School of Hygiene and Public Health. Uh, he joined the faculty in 19, uh, the school opened in 1916. He joined the faculty in 1917. He wrote the first book in modern book on nutrition called The Newer Knowledge of Nutrition in 1918. He, he's a, he was a very productive young man. Uh, and he discovered vitamin A. What we put into a footnote is that he discovered vitamin A at the University of Wisconsin uh, before he came to Hopkins. But we let you fill in that blank. You know, we say he was at Hopkins. He discovered vitamin A, we leave it at that. And, uh, but if I'm at the University of Wisconsin, I tell them that, yes, we, we know that he discovered it there. 
But he wrote a book and he had some paragraphs, many paragraphs in that book. A couple that I have translated into simpler language here. He 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 um, um, dedicated that book to Professor Eichmann, uh, the same Eichmann that the Institute of Molecular Biology is uh, named after. And he said, basically, an undernourished population may suffer from several micronutrient deficiencies, not just one. So that is a tip of the hat that vitamin A is not the only nutrient that is needed, that you need the entire array of essential nutrients that come from the diet. Preventing only the clinical deficiency does not ensure good nutrition, as subclinical deficient mothers and infants may still suffer poor health and high risk of mortality. This is 1918. Uh, and we know that children with xerophthalmia suffer a risk of blindness. We know that most nutrient deficiencies, many of them have very clear clinical signs, whether it's beriberi or scurvy or goiter uh, for these individual nutrients. But we also have come to learn that the subclinical deficiencies are the bottom of the iceberg. And most people in the population, in populations that are undernourished, uh, may be suffering from subclinical, but metabolically important and pathogenically important nutritional deficiencies. Marginal subclinical deficiency resulting from a poor diet may be of far greater public health importance than the more rare clinical disease. So these were coherent observations that were drawn <clears throat> 100 years ago, and we're still in the process of proving them. So this is a rat. This is a rat that still lives at the School of Public Health. Well, he doesn't live, but he's stuffed. And um, he was one of Professor McCollum's uh, experimental rats. But you can tell he was the control rat, not the vitamin A deficient rat, because his eyes are bright and his fur is soft. <clears throat> his body is a little stiff at this point. But uh, Professor McCollum published a paper in 1913 uh, showing how a rat is supposed to grow and how the rat grows when you deprive it of this ether soluble substance that can be found in butter fat and egg yolks. And if you deprive the rat long enough, it will reach a weight plateau. It'll start losing weight. It will become infected and die if you do not replete the rat with that ether-soluble compound. And then it will start to grow again. This was shown hundreds and hundreds of times in the, in the last century, uh, part of the assay to determine how much vitamin A is required in mammals. However, also around 1920, this is the first histogram I could find. By then, there had been many small animal experiments on vitamin A deficiency, <clears throat> as it was known. And this is a, a histogram of rats who were dying when they were on a deficient diet, and rats that were dying with eye signs, xerophthalmia. Notice that there are rats dying before any eye signs appear. And, uh, and even when the deficiency is going on for now 60 days, 70 days, 80 days, uh, the, uh, most of the, the animals that are dying did not have xerophthalmia. So we should have realized that that might be true in children as well. So we'll jump ahead a half a century to 1974, the modern era, as it were. And this is Henry Kissinger. <clears throat> he was the department, he was the um, Secretary of State in the United States in 1974. And this is him speaking at the World Food Conference on November 5th, 1974. And there was a nutritionist at USAID at that time named Martin Foreman. Martin Foreman, Dr. Foreman got a hold of Kissinger's speech and he inserted 
the following lines. The United States calls for an immediate campaign against two of the most prevalent and blighting forms of malnutrition, vitamin A blindness and iron deficiency anemia. And Henry Kissinger just read it. He didn't know what he was reading. He just read it because it was in his speech. Within three weeks, the government of Indonesia invited WHO uh, and other agencies to a meeting here in Jakarta uh, that was on vitamin A deficiency and xerophthalmia. Basically, what should we do about this problem? And a, re a report was was prepared, a WHO report, a little blue book, <clears throat> reporting on the on the minutes and the things that were talked about in that conference. That led to funding uh, Helen Keller International uh, for four or five years here in Indonesia. Professor Alfred Sommer was recruited to come here uh, to, uh, based in Bandung at the Chichendo Eye Hospital and to start working with ophthalmologists in Bandung <clears throat> to carry out a national xerophthalmia survey around the, the entire country, a longitudinal study in uh, West Java amongst around 4,500 children <clears throat> to understand the natural history of mild xerophthalmia, night blindness and veto spots that do not blind, and at that time were considered mild deficiency. No one is supposed to have a veto spot though, and no one is supposed to have night blindness. So. We now know that mild eye signs is not mild deficiency. It's moderate deficiency, if not severe. So that started <clears throat> clinical studies, uh, epidemiological studies, and a survey. Uh, there, were, there was another workshop here in Jakarta in 1970. Uh, uh, where is it? Sorry. In October of 1980, uh, to see what had happened. So the government of Indonesia gathered these groups ag together again to see what has happened since 1974, six years later, to track progress. <clears throat> no country had ever done this before, uh, to take a nutritional deficiency and insist on seeing where the progress was. <clears throat> well, a lot had been done. For example, the studies in Bandung clearly showed that children were going blind in the late, in the mid seventies here in Indonesia as a result of vitamin A deficiency, developing corneal blindness. <clears throat> we see corneal xerosis in this eye. It's a drying of the cornea of the corneal surface epithelium that can cloud vision. It can lead to keratomalacia, which is a full uh, thickness edema of the corneal lens that can scar and blind. And when children have those eye signs, they are usually very sick. This child has measles. He's got corneal xerophthalmia in his right eye. And this child has marasmus. Very sick children, very vitamin A deficient, and with high fatality. This is not that long ago. It may sound like it's a long time ago, but it wasn't very long ago. There are reasons for that, those eye signs, and they relate to the role that vitamin A, one of its intermediates, retinoic acid, when it gets into the cell, it is transported to the nucleus, <clears throat> it binds to DNA, and it uh, activates the transcription of uh, and translation of proteins that are required for cell function. Enzymes, transporters, all kinds of molecules that are needed, hundreds of molecules that are dependent on vitamin A activating their transcription. One of the, and so it is this mechanism that explains why children's eyes uh, change uh, with vitamin A deficiency. Those proteins are required to differentiate cells 
in the manner that they are supposed to happen. If there is not vitamin A, they still will differentiate, but they will go in a different direction. And so mucus secreting cells will become dry and skin-like, for example. That can happen on the eye. The eye has goblet cells and mucus secreting cells to keep us bright, keep our eyes bright and seeing. Absent of vitamin A, those cells will differentiate. They will undergo a change in a different direction that is more like skin. And that is what causes xerophthalmia, which means drying of the eye. It's not, uh, it's not just the, the linings of the epithelial linings of the eye, though. Um, I've put a little note over here. <clears throat> it's the gastrointestinal tract. It's the genitourinary tract. It's the respiratory tract. It's ducts and glands. Wherever there are epithelial tissues that are rapidly turning over, if there's deficiency, those cells will change their shape and function and not in the right direction. But it will also be required for immune cells, bone cells. They all require vitamin A to differentiate properly. So there's a lot of biology around this issue. You can see a child that has B toe spots just by shining a, a light uh, obliquely at the eye. And you will see an eye that is not glistening. If I shine a light on your conjunctiva, Fatima, it will give a reflex back. It'll be a nice, bright, shiny light coming back. In a child with B toe spots, it's diffuse. It looks like a sandbank uh, and very granular. And you can see it with your naked eye. You don't need fancy, all you need is a flashlight uh, and you can see it. So it is a sign of epithelial linings in the body in the eye going wrong, but there is also an indicator uh, for what's going on in the rest of the, of the epithelial linings in the body as well. The other major thing that vitamin A is required for is the visual cycle. So this is a, we won't go through this in detail, but this is the bloodstream. This is a, a retinol binding protein that carries vitamin A in the bloodstream from the liver. It transfers into the retinal pigment epithelium on the back of the eye. It undergoes lots of transformations, but it ends up at the tip of the rod photoreceptor cells that are waiting for light to hit the, to come into the eye and transform that uh, photon of light into an impulse that travels through the optic nerve and provides vision. Without vitamin A connected to this protein called opsin that forms rhodopsin, you cannot, those rod cells will not fire when light enters the eye. And these rod cells are required for night vision. You know, when you are in the dark, you have to scan, or if you're in the military, you're taught to scan at night because the rod cells are not in the fovea, they are in the, on the peripheral parts of the retina. And if you scan, you can see things moving in the night, in the dark, that you can't see if you look at it directly. Those are your rod cells working and they require vitamin A to function. If a child or a pregnant mother is vitamin A deficient, uh, those uh, rod cells don't have the vitamin A. They will not be activated by dim light. And therefore, the, the individual will develop night blindness as a result, meaning that you can see in the daytime, but not at night. So, this is the earliest sign of vitamin A deficiency, ocular sign. And this is just a child from a depiction in the Philippines to show that, you know, it's not just Indonesia. The problem is elsewhere as well. Uh, and then I have chickens there. Why do I have chickens in that picture? I made a mistake, right? So who here lives with chickens? Raise your hand, don't be ashamed. Good, one, the country has changed. 
What do chickens do during the daytime? Besides lay eggs and they flap around, right? They they're running all over the place. They look they're like chickens without their heads, right? What do they do at night? They 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 hide and they wait and they wait through the darkness, wondering if they have died. And then there's a little bit of light that comes up and the cock crows and everybody's very happy because they realize they're going to live another day. Chickens are genetically night blind. They do not have rods in the backs of their eyes. <clears throat> and so the behavioral diagnosis is frequently made in cultures where night blindness is common. And uh, the term will be chicken eyes. So the children or the pregnant mother who's undernourished and vitamin A deficient will behave a little bit like a chicken. Uh, you know, fine during the daytime and at night, the children will latch onto their mother's clothes. They won't play with their siblings. They will not leave the aura of light because they can't see at nighttime. If you give that child vitamin A, the next night, the kid is out there running around in the dark as if, you know, nothing w w has changed. It happens very quickly and responds. But that is vitamin A getting to the back of the eye and allowing those rod cells to fire. So between those two biological pathways, regulating gene transcription to make a myriad of proteins that are required for cells to properly differentiate and the, the visual cycle that allows uh, individuals to see at night have been combined into a WHO um, classification system that uh, Dr. Sommer prepared for when he was in Bandung, working there in Bandung, uh, here in West Java, uh, that stands today. This is the WHO classification system for xerophthalmia that is used around the world. Uh, and it is the work of the ophthalmologists at uh, Chichendo Rumasaki. So here is a paper that was published in 1983. And it is the first study to show that mild xerophthalmia is not mild vitamin A deficiency. And it may be a major consequence in terms of morbidity and mortality. This is uh, the mortality of children with normal eyes, if they reported night blindness, if they had B toe spots, which is this patch on the surface of the eye, or if they had the two conditions combined. These are not blinding eye conditions. These are mild eye signs. But clearly, there was an increased risk of mortality. And this led to the hypothesis that not only you know, that children with mild xerophthalmia are at higher risk. If you, if you prevent the mild xerophthalmia, you may reduce the risk of mortality. But there was also mortality in children with normal eyes. Uh, and to what degree might there be subclinical vitamin A deficiency operating there? And so the Ache study was done. And this is about the time when I came to Indonesia for the first time in January of 1982. Uh, and was mostly up in Aceh from 1982 to 84. Uh, and we carried out a trial in 450 villages with 26,000 children. Uh, and we were allowed by the Director General of Health Services Professor A. A. Luden, to randomize villages, the number of villages that were going to get vitamin A, the vitamin A program in Aceh that year. So it was not placebo controlled. We, we identified 400, 450 villages. <clears throat> we mapped those villages, enumerated the children, put labels and, on the houses, where workers could go and put their names on it and date for if, when they visited the home. <clears throat> and in 225 of those villages, there was a vitamin A program that rolled out 
uh, through the government of Indonesia, we added some monitors to just make sure that things were going as planned. And there were 225 uh, control villages that did not get the program. There was no budget for, their, for them to get the program at the time. And this was um, a real field study, uh, very exciting work. Uh, this is a young Keith West right here. Uh, there was no Google Maps. There was no Google Maps. We had to draw them. We had to draw 450 maps. <clears throat> and you can see this is the Dessa Ruchut um, with the numbered houses and the streets and the paths where we could then identify the children. We would put labels on the houses uh, and marking a, another label indicating when the child got their vitamin A capsule that they were supposed to get during the program. We had a central site in a sub-study area, a, sub of, a subset of villages where um, children were examined for their eyes and got anthropometry. This is uh, Dr. Custiano and Akbar Panji from Bandung, from Chichendo Hospital, who were the ophthalmologists that examined the eyes of these children. We did find xerophthalmia. This is a child with a staphyloma. It's a bulging eye. The eye became uh, weak, edematous, and the ocular pressure pushed out the eye and blinded the child. But he survived. Uh, these children have. Beto spots, mild xerophthalmia. So the condition was clinically there in Aceh. If they had xerophthalmia, they were treated with vitamin A, regardless of what kind of a village they were, they were in. And it was, it was difficult. Uh, there were times when the vehicles got stuck, when we had to drive across rivers, not the Trans-Sumatran Highway that I think is halfway done was not there at all. Uh, and so uh, Dr. Bob Tilden and myself, I'm in this vehicle, he's driving this vehicle. We, it took 12 days to drive from Jakarta to Banda Aceh for the, for the study. And this is what happened. This is, the, this is called a um, cumulative mortality curve. Um, and so the higher the, the, the curve, uh, the higher the mortality rate uh, in the control villages and in the uh, vi villages where children were given a dose of vitamin A every six months. There was a 34% reduction in child mortality. And that translated into 200,000 children in Indonesia alone whose lives could be saved by just giving these children four cents, which is what? Now, a hundred rupiah or something? No, thousand rupiah, a million rupiah. I don't know. It, I, I get lost in all the zeros. Twice a year, the government initiated uh, an acceleration of the program and it became the first country to have a nationwide high coverage vitamin A supplementation program that served as an example for vitamin A supplementation to be launched literally around the world. Other countries were had started the program uh, in the 70s in Bangladesh and India to a certain extent and a few other countries. But Indonesia ramped up its national program at an accelerated rate and kept it there. And it's there today. Uh, there are now 85 countries around the world that receive the, where the children get vitamin A every six months. But as I'll point out, there you have to you have to constantly pay attention to policy and constantly renew the information and the education that has to go on for funders, for government ministries, because people change and they don't know why vitamin A is being given to children after 25 or 35 years. So uh, it requires, it's like tending a garden. You know, you have to pull out the weeds to keep the flowers growing. Uh, and so too with 
nutrition policy, you need to renew, you have to re-educate and keep the advocacy at a high level to keep a program going for as long as it's needed. How long is it needed? Until vitamin A deficiency does not exist as a public health problem. How do you know that has happened? You have to do surveys. And so this summer, uh, the, the Ministry of Health is carrying out the first vitamin A serum retinol survey around the country to determine the national and regional prevalence of vitamin A deficiency. No other country has done it. There has been complacency uh, around the world with respect to vitamin A. And so the Indonesian government, once again, is leading the way to say, the only way we can reduce vitamin A supplementation, if we are going to reduce it, is to do a survey and to have the evidence around uh, whether this can uh, be still a problem or not. <clears throat> you need evidence. Um, and uh, uh, Professor Endong here has been a, a real supercharger in terms of making this happen uh, across the country in the coming year. So one study does not quite do it. The Aceh study generated a lot of interest and there were believers and non-believers and both were very vocal, both groups were very vocal and um, it required more evidence to confirm or negate the uh, findings. And so uh, we carried out, the our Hopkins team carried out another trial in Nepal in 1989 to 92 and found the same thing. Here's, here's the cumulative mortality, here's the control group, and here's the vitamin A group. And that relative risk of 0.7, if you subtract that from one, that's the, that's the risk of children in the vitamin A group, the risk of dying relative to the risk of dying of, amongst children in the control group. So if you take that ratio, you get a 0.7. If you subtract that from one, you can say it's a 30% 30 30 reduction in child mortality. Well, here, um, let's see, I didn't put the, oh, here it is. There's Sasa, do you see that Sasa there? I'm sure Ajinomoto would be happy to know it's hiding. Pat Muhilal in Bogor. Uh, decided that we needed to explore other ways to provide vitamin A. And so he carried out a trial uh, in a large number of villages uh, in West Java. And uh, the, there were villages where MSG was fortified with vitamin A, went through the Warung and mothers bought the packets and put it in the food. And so vitamin A went into the diet or not, or just regular sasa. Uh, and those children in the MSG group is their, their survival is here. And here's the survival in the, uh, in the mortality rather in the MSG and the MSG plus vitamin A group. There was a 44% reduction in child mortality with MSG. The problem there, MSG is not fortified with vitamin A in Indonesia. And do you know why? It turns it orange. Vitamin A has, is yellow orange and you can't hide it that well. You, we try, you can cover it with titanium oxide. You can try to whiten it, but ultimately it forms a little orange band in the middle of the packet. And MSG is sold because it is pure and white and not yellow. Uh, and so it has never been fortified. But uh, the impact on mortality was huge. And so fortification has been nonetheless pursued in this country with other foods. Vegetable oil right now is a major um effort underway to fortify vegetable oil with vitamin A so it can go into the diet uh, through that route. But notice that here, here is the Aceh trial, but here's a trial in the far Western uh, section of Nepal, 
Uh, here's southern India, where children were given not 200,000 units every six months, but smaller amounts of vitamin A every week. So kind of like a diet. Uh, and there was over a 50% reduction in mortality. Here's the vitamin A group. Here's the control group. And there were trials in Africa as well. This led to uh, many meetings and conferences that led to then vitamin A supplementation being um, uh, a program that would be uh, uh, carried out around the world. Uh, and this is an example of a, what we call the Bellagio Brief. In Bellagio, Italy, there is a conference center and uh, a number of people stayed in that conference center for a week and argued and came together about what can we say about vitamin A to the public, to the global public. And, uh, and then a statement was uh, developed and published. This is the Indian Journal of Pediatrics, but it went into the South African Medical Journal. It went into uh, journals around the world to get the message out. There was no internet at that time. Uh, and so this was the internet precedent uh, to get the word out about vitamin A being essential for normal health. It, it, deficiency increases mortality. Uh, you give vitamin A and you can increase survival and so forth. Just the basics, the basics that needed to get out uh, and that worked, it worked. Uh, the policies were uh, developed around the world and the World Bank, in its World Development Report in 1993, looked at all the interventions that were known at the time that could improve um, health and survival. And two, the further to the right, upper corner, the, the better. The two best ones were breastfeeding and vitamin A supplementation. And that became a global focus for moving not only supplementation forward, but fortification around the world and biofortification. Uh, that is taking crops and through plant breeding, breeding more plant-based vitamin A into those crops. Uh, carotenoids, the pigment that can be converted to vitamin A uh, in the intestines. And so that program, now there are crops there are sweet potatoes and there's maize and there's other kinds of crops that have carotenoids in them that are being adopted in countries around the world to improve the vitamin A intake. Again, it all comes back to Indonesia. A few other things about supplementation beyond mortality. Hearing loss is a huge problem in around the world, but especially in low and middle income countries. And the leading cause of hearing loss in children is middle ear infection, otitis media, hussy, purulent ears. And so uh, in our trial in Nepal, one of those graphs that I showed you, uh, we asked mothers about children's discharging ears every four months. You know, mothers know when their children have a pussy ear. They're constantly looking in the ear, they're constantly cleaning out their ears. You know, they know when their children have an ear infection and when the children have an ear infection, it tends to last a long time. So here is a graph that shows the risk of hearing loss in children by the number of episodes that they have otitis media. Uh, in Nepal, so from zero to five. And look how the odds ratio, this is the odds of hearing loss in those um, uh, who have middle ear infections divided by the odds of hearing loss in those who do not, did not get ear infections. Uh, as assessed when they were adolescents, we went back to this cohort of thousands and thousands of children in Nepal 15, 16 years later, and we carried out audiometry on those children in the villages. And so their risk of hearing loss goes, if they have one episode, it's two and a half, all the way up to 14, 15, 17 times higher risk 
of having, ha of having hearing loss if they had ear discharge. And I won't go through all this other than, than to say that this is a graph of hearing loss in those children who overall, who had no ear infection and children who had any ear discharge when they were preschoolers as assessed later on in adolescence. And the difference, if children do not have any ear, ear discharge, 3%, 3.5% of those adolescents had hearing loss. If they had ear discharge, 20% had hearing loss. But if they got the vitamin A when they were a preschooler, it was down to 13%. And so that is a 42% reduction in hearing loss from ear discharge, ear infection, if children are getting their vitamin A every four to six months. Um, why? It reduces the severity of the ear infection. It reduces the severity, just like it reduces the severity of diarrhea or dysentery or measles or malaria. If you reduce the severity of an infection, a child will be more likely to live. And if the infection is in the ear, more likely to hear uh, beyond the, uh, this, the preschool years. Here's another interesting discovery in Bandung at Hassan Siddiquin Hospital uh, in Bandung uh, in the 90s. Um, a trial was carried out in 2000 babies uh, born at the hospital, and they were randomized to get a few drops of vitamin A on the tongue at birth or not. And those children were followed for a year. And whoops. I don't know what happened to that slide. Can you see anything there? I don't see anything. Okay. Well, what you would see if it was there is you would see survival, a mortality curve that looks just like what we just saw in Ache. Only now we're talking about babies given vitamin A at birth. And so that was published uh, by... Gene Humphrey and Professor Tina Augustina and others uh, in 1996 and 97. Uh, it created almost no excitement whatsoever uh, until it was repeated in South India in, 1990, in 2003. And there was a 23% reduction in infant mortality if a little bit of vitamin A was given to the baby at birth. We within six months started another trial in Bangladesh. And there was a 15, 16% reduction in infant mortality with a little bit of vitamin A at birth. Another trial was carried out in India in the slums of Delhi, a reduction in infant mortality. There were also trials carried out in Africa and none of them showed a reduction in infant mortality. So really interesting, right? So the trials all worked in South Asia, and none of them worked in Africa. So why? And if you can answer that question, you're gonna be a professor. We don't know, <laughs> except what, what has happened is that the, in meta-analyses, all of those trials have been combined. You know, the ones in Asia that showed a reduction, the ones in Africa that did not, and it is not a large overall and or significant effect. And so the world presently thinks that newborn vitamin A has no effect on, on infant mortality. When it did reduce infant mortality in Asia and not in Africa, maybe it's the gut microbiome differences. Maybe the trials were not done in the right populations in Africa. You know, there could be lots of reasons, but no one is believing it. So I posed this question to Einstein, where he said, you know, everything should be made as simple as possible, but not simpler. So maybe we shouldn't be looking for a global estimate of impact that is not relevant anywhere. So I asked him what he would think. 
He, he would say, I, I think he would say, newborn vitamin A reduces infant mortality in Southern Asia and not in Africa. Hmm. Supplement newborns with vitamin A in Southern Asia and not in Africa. But that is not happening yet. There's no program. So uh, it is, we've estimated that there are about 160 to 180,000 infant deaths every year across Southern Asia, India, Nepal, Bangladesh, all the way through Indonesia and the Philippines that could be saved every year if babies got a dose of vitamin A at birth. It doesn't affect their breastfeeding, um, but it's not happening. So there is a public health issue for you. Night blindness uh, also occurs, I mentioned, in, in mothers uh, in pregnancy, especially in the third trimester of pregnancy, if, if they're undernourished, especially. Uh, you know, the, the demands of pregnancy of the placenta and the fetus uh, and the growing maternal tissues are all placing nutritional stress <clears throat> on the mother's reserves. And if she is deficient, she will develop night blindness. And the night blindness goes away after the baby is born. So you shed the baby and the placenta, and within three to six days later, the night blindness goes away. But the vitamin A deficiency that causes it is still there. It's just that the stresses of all that physio physiological stress uh, has been relieved. We have shown in Nepal that women with night blindness are at higher risk of anemia, being thin, having more morbidity episodes during pregnancy. They have a higher risk of mortality themselves and a higher risk of infant mortality. A, a, a night blind woman during pregnancy is like raising a red flag in the family and in the community because xerophthalmia and vitamin A deficiency clusters. So if you find one or two cases in a community, you're gonna find others as well if you look hard enough. We don't know what the prevalence of night blindness is these days because it's not being asked in any surveys, but it is something to keep in mind because nutritional status has improved, for example, in Indonesia a great deal over the years. But nutritional deficiencies are never eradicated. They are only controlled. And you can lose control when the diet gets poor, when economic stresses go up, if a, there's a financial market collapse, if crops fail, there can be all kinds of reasons why nutrition can go down, why the diet can get poor, uh, and it can always return. So it's an important indicator to ask about. This is just a, this is a, a slide from a study in uh, Cambodia, uh, and it's showing odds ratios, right? So odds ratios are a, a risk indicator. Um, if uh, the mother had xerophthalmia um, in the current or last pregnancy, what's the risk in her children of getting xerophthalmia? And it's four times higher. Uh, and these are just different kinds of risk indicators related to children getting uh, having night blindness or xerophthalmia if the mother does. And even after you adjust for other factors, the, that remains high. If a woman had a night blindness history in the last pregnancy, she is 40 times more likely to have night blindness in this pregnancy. So it clusters across people, across family members, from mother to child. And within the mother, it clusters from one pregnancy to the next. Here's a study in India. And I won't make you read this, or it will not be on your exam. Uh, and it's just showing that, that this, this table here is showing that the risk of babies having diarrhea, dysentery, or different definitions of acute respiratory infection, these relative risks are all above one, 25 to 35% higher risks of diarrhea. If the mother, if the mother 
had night blindness. So we're talking about probably babies being vitamin A deficient and having uh, those kinds of uh, of impaired impaired metabolism and impaired physiology in terms of epithelial defenses and immune defenses uh, early in infancy. Why would women be night blind? Well, they would be night blind if their diets are not adequate. So in Nepal, for example, we've carried out studies a uh, couple years in a row, 2013, 14, 15, we went to the same national sample in the mountains and the hills and the plains of Nepal, 5,000 households, visiting them every July and August and asked them about their diet. And they were, they were consuming rice 14 times a week, twice a day, the lentil soup, the dal, once a day, seven times a week. Vegetable oil going up, <laughs> more you know, snack foods and fried foods were going up uh, uh, with time. But look at poultry, meat and poultry, dairy products, eggs, an average of zero times per week, dark green leafy vegetables, two to three times a week, a very, very meager diet. Uh, and so... Uh, it, there's in, information that can be obtained by doing proper dietary surveys. Um, there can't be in this national survey, a dietary survey in Indonesia this summer because it's too soon. But in future surveys, it may well be possible uh, to either add dietary assessment uh, to mothers and children to document whether the diet aligns with the status. If vitamin A status is adequate, there should be evidence of the diet being adequate as well. If the vitamin A status is low, you might expect to see the diet be low, and it will tell you what foods we need to work on in order to help uh, raise uh, vitamin A status. Um, I think I'll go by that one right. Well, maybe I'll, I'll just quickly say that there, another study that has been carried out here in Indonesia uh, looked at dark green leafy vegetables uh, in, in women of reproductive age uh, and uh, gave these women for several weeks uh, a, a daily amount of vegetables. Uh, but they also gave the, another group of women a wafer that contained a vitamin that contained beta carotene right here, this group, uh, or a control. And what was shown is that the women who ate green leafy vegetables, this, this is serum retinol, breast milk retinol, serum beta carotene, the pre form, the pre the precursor of vitamin A. If women ate the green leafy vegetables, they really weren't very different than the control in terms of their vitamin A status. And that's because green leafy vegetables have a very tough fiber. It's difficult to digest them. If the same amount of beta carotene was put into a wafer, their serum retinol went up, the mother's breast milk levels went up, and their serum beta carotene went up. So, uh, it emphasizes that vegetables need to be really cooked well in order to break down the fiber so that the carotenoids can go in. But this study in Indonesia led to a global review of how much beta carotene should be, should be used to, as, a, as, a, as a formula to convert to vitamin A. What should the ratio be? And up to this time of this study in Indonesia, it was six to one. So six parts beta carotene equals one part vitamin A in the diet. This changed thinking around the world. And now the ratio that is accepted is 12 to one to be more realistic about how much beta carotene is actually converted to vitamin A in cooked green leafy vegetables. It's not to say green leafy vegetables are not nutritious. They are. They have lots of nutrients, but we have to be realistic also about children eating green leafy vegetables and whether we can expect 
those children to have normal vitamin A status uh, if they are not also drinking some milk and having some egg and even getting fortified food um, to keep their vitamin A status normal. Okay, I don't know where that, is that another one? I don't know where they came from. So to wrap this up, we think of, of the deficiency. We need to know what the prevalence is. We have ways to prevent. Uh, and so there is the dietary approach. You know, to, to look at what season, what's the seasonality of fruits and vegetables, uh, the cost of eggs, the cost of dairy products. What is the cost of a, the minimal cost of, a, of an adequate diet? Uh, and how does that match against um, the incomes of the poor by season? So that we have data, you know, and knowledge about what can the poor buy that is in the market at different times of the year in order to meet their requirements. It's a long process and it goes up and down with the seasons and with the year. There's fortification. This is a sugar cube. Actually, it's a sugar cube in Guatemala, but sugar, sugar crystals look the same all over the world. Uh, hiding behind here is a, is a bead of vitamin A. This is actually a fortified sugar crystal. Uh, sugar can be fortified with vitamin A. Sugar is not a good food, to be sure. But if people are going to eat it, it can be a vehicle for moving vitamin A into the diet without advertising the vitamin A, without advertising it. Uh, and that has worked. That has worked in throughout Central America and the northern countries of, of South America all fortify sugar with vitamin A. And it's moved on, right? The vegetable oil and other foods are being, you know, examined, tested, and moving forward. There's supplementation, of course. There's breastfeeding. Breast milk colostrum is high in vitamin A in a well-nourished mother. Beta carotene is very high. These amounts change over time. And so if a child is given pre-lacteal food and a little honey and juice and you know different things, uh, different fluids, it will take longer to establish breastfeeding in those moms and those babies. And that, um, that can lead to two days or even three days before children are established on breast milk. Those few days are critical uh, in terms of vitamin A having an impact on ramping up the gut immune system to begin to figure out friend versus foe, tolerance versus uh, uh, immune response to fight infection. Vitamin A is required in the gut for that to happen. And if children are given you know, other fluids other than colostrum, uh, that can actually have a, a disadvantage uh, uh, in the, in terms of the immune system and the ability of a young baby to withstand, um, early, early infections. We think that's one reason why newborn vitamin A can work. It actually delivers an amount of vitamin A to that gut right away in terms of helping to ramp it up. And then there's biofortification. So we have all those kinds of, of interventions. Um, I think I'll go by that right now. That's just a slide on supplementation. So if one thinks about how this happens, if you do a survey and you find that there's a problem, what Indonesia did, you supplemented. You got a program going nationally uh, fast and, you know, uh, nobody's perfect. You know, I, I drew the line at 90%. You know, not everybody got it. Um, but that supplement can will not improve the diet. It won't solve the problem, but it does prevent the mortality, the blindness, the hearing loss, and other kinds of consequences that we may not know about uh, related to deficiency. While that goes on, 
you work on fortification. And maybe there's even two foods that can be fortified. And that will be, that won't cover everybody, but it will, you know, start to move vitamin A into the diets of a fraction of the population. There are other things that can be done. The dietary change is slow and grinding, but necessary. And then there could be biofortification of one or maybe even two crops that are grown in rural areas that could provide beta carotene, a dietary safety net. When all you put all that together, you could start to start to think about bringing supplementation down if the evidence supports it. it. We should not be stopping supplementation because we're tired of it, or you know we've done it long enough, time to move on. The deficiency has to be controlled by diet in order to reduce the program for supplementation. So, the things that have been going on in Indonesia, the first WHO meetings on vitamin A deficiency in Jakarta, the first population estimates of the incidence of blinding xerophthalmia, the corneal disease, and the only estimates in the world. It hasn't been replicated. It's one study in West Java that provides uh, a population-based estimate of corneal disease in a population that's undernourished without vitamin A. Dietary risk factors, Pak Torwojo, who directed the Gizi in the, in the in Depkes for uh, many years, uh, a nutritionist and a, and a mentor to me, um, carried out dietary studies of risk factors for xerophthalmia. What foods do you need to consume in order to provide some protection against that eye disease? the risk of child mortality increasing with mild xerophthalmia, the effects of vitamin A supplementation on mortality. The, the, one of the first national vitamin A supplementation programs and then other innovations. Um, vitamin A status assessment, Dr. Uh, Gantira Natha Desastra at uh, uh, Chichendo Hospital developed a technique for uh, putting a piece of paper filter paper on the conjunctival surface and lifting it off. And what comes off are cells. And you can, you can stain those cells and look, look at them and see if they are abnormal. And if they are abnormal, the child is vitamin A deficient. If they are normal, he's not. Very innovative. Uh, it hasn't taken off because nobody likes to have a paper strip put on their eye. Vitamin A supplementation and anemia. Uh, I don't, I don't think Professor Siti is here today, but the, there's been research uh, here in Indonesia looking at how vitamin A affects anemia, hemoglobin, and hematopoiesis. If you make a child vitamin A deficient, if they, he is vitamin A deficient, there will be anemia there. And part of that anemia is due to vitamin A deficiency, not iron deficiency. Vitamin A in child growth, uh, pa, hamam. Hadi in Jakarta, his doctoral dissertation, which was my doctoral student, uh, showed very nicely that uh, children will grow if you give grow a little bit better if you give them vitamin A, but that will not happen if they are burdened with respiratory infection. So it, deficient children will respond in their growth, but not if they have too much infection that's sort of draining their vitamin A and diverting it from anabolic activity to preventing the infection. Dietary bioavailability of carotenoids, newborn vitamin A reducing mortality, and so forth. So in closing, I want to leave you just with an epidemiological construct uh, as you think about your own nutritional deficiencies that you are interested in. Um, this is Epi 101, but I tell you, it's most of what I use all of my career. So Epi 101 will teach you most of what you need to know to move research forward. That deficiencies happen, they occur by person, place, and time. So you can describe any disease 
any deficiency, once you have defined the population, where they are, and when they get it, seasonally or time trends. And then the risk factors for understanding why people are deficient can be found when examining the agent, the host, or the environment. And the agent can be, if you're an infectious disease epidemiologist, it may be a pathogen, right? That's the agent. But dietary deficiency can be an agent as well. Uh, and, and the two together, you know, infection and dietary deficiency can be synergistic in creating deficiency. The host may be a, a factor. Uh, not everybody exposed to a pathogen will get diarrhea. Not everybody who smokes will get cancer. Uh, there's numerous examples of host factors. They may be genetic. They may be nutritional overall. Uh, but there are person-to-person -person factors that need to be understood to associate risk. And then there's the environment. Uh, and that will dictate many different other exposures that can lead to or prevent a deficiency. So if you keep those th that simple construct in mind and think about how to measure and, importantly, count, epidemiologists have to count. That's the most important skill, be able to count. Uh, uh, you can put these profiles together across those intersecting uh, factors about where deficiencies exist and what may be the causative factors. Uh, and you will go far in starting to understand what interventions may be necessary or possibly efficacious to um, prevent the deficiency. Why is that coming up? Okay, so uh, I think that last one was supposed to be a simple triangle of showing basic biology leading to disease identification, and sometimes it goes into public health, but it's actually more complex than that. Uh, and so we need to be realizing that there's always going to be a need for biological research, understand nutriture, molecular function, and how that affects disease, how undernutrition affects disease. Those observations can start to inform epidemiological questions and measurements that are made. Uh, the omics research that is going on, you know, starting to look at genomics, transcriptomics, metabolomics, proteomics for identifying biomarkers of nutritional deficiency and consequence. That is the era that we are in. That's the era that students of today are going to develop your careers in. So become familiar with and even work with new biomarkers that can be used in the community for nutritional status and deficiencies. These all can lead to the need for intervention trials uh, that can sometimes produce effects that lead to public health action. And then you need to implement. And implementation science, implementation research is an expanding and nascent early field. We do not do it very well because bringing a program agency into a research framework is really hard, but it has to be done in order to get programs to run properly. You cannot do this without politics, policies, and resources. So the public health worker needs to be politically savvy uh, and networked and an advocate and a speaker. You have to know what you're talking about and say it well and communicate with those who are not interested in what you are doing to get them interested. And at some point, you might effectively prevent. And so this is biological complexity. And we are really complex creatures. Our biology is very complex. But we are also complex in how we deal with each other. <laughs> so biological complexity and societal complexity 
and they all they're, they're, it doesn't go one way. It's constantly moving up and down. This is like a mitochondria in the cell. It's constantly on the roll. And we need to be operating at each of those levels to some degree in order to be effective public health professionals. Three Makasi. I think we have time for questions, right? We're going to take a break and then come back for dinner, right? We hope so too, Professor. <laughs> dinner is on me. <laughs> okay. Uh, thank you very much, Professor Keith, for your eye-opening lecture. Um, it is intriguing uh, knowing how vitamin A deficiency is associated with many detrimental health effects, vision loss, hearing loss, um, even mortality, Professor. And... Uh, it reminds us that there are still many things to be done, especially since you mentioned that Indonesia is one of the leading role in um, eliminating the problem of vitamin, vitamin A deficiency. So it reminds us to do something more. And then I think it is also a good exposure for the students here to see the global status of vitamin A deficiency, not only in Indonesia, but also outside Indonesia as well. Um, so I guess I can send some of the burning questions already. Uh, I would like to open the question and answer session, not only for the students, but for lecturers here. If you also have questions for Professor Keith, please kindly uh, raise your hands. Wow, we already have one question over there. Do we have any more questions? Uh, I think we will do it one by one, Professor, okay? Yeah. Uh, can we have the microphone for the person asking uh, the gentleman over there with black shirt? Or, um, okay. I'll take it. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> Let's see, where's our questionnaire? Here you are. It's like a talk show, you know? <laughs> And we still wait for the bungong jumpa in the end, Professor. <laughs> okay, uh, thank you for the good presentation. That's uh, such an amazing presentation. We know about the vitamin A consequence and also how can we tackle this issue. So my question is that, first of all, uh, I already heard about the consequence, what uh, vitamin A deficiency can cause something, but I would like ask something like malnutrition costs uh, vitamin A deficiency or F uh, VAD. So we know that uh, when we consume vitamin A, uh, it will be transported using RBP or retinol binding protein. And this RBP was produced in our liver using pre-albumin. And pre-albumin uh, uh, came from our diet itself. So when people have a malnutrition, uh, the pre-albumin production also will be low. And we know that malnutrition is a global issue. And uh, what's your comment, Professor, regarding that? So if malnutrition still persists in our world right now, will VAD also persist with that? And that's my first question. And the second question is regarding the maternal uh, VAD. Uh, on your presentation, you stated that 10% of the world maternal still having a VAD. And as far as I know, uh, correct me if I am wrong, uh, if maternal consume a large uh, portion of vitamin A, it will cause a birth defect to their child. So uh, is there any proposed solution before in the past? So maybe that's the two question, Prof. Thank you. So the first question. So uh, those were really two good questions. Um, and so Vitamin A supplementation will have its effect on mortality regardless of how undernourished a child is. It is true that if your protein energy, if you're protein deficient severely, there will be effects on uh, prealbumin, but retinol binding protein as well. There is also, you know, there's a synergism of infection and malnutrition. Infection leads to, to you know, poor appetite, uh, increased catabolism and more malnutrition, which can affect the immune capabilities as well. Uh, and so you have this spiral. Um, and we see that perhaps most visibly with measles cases. Uh, children with severe measles will become wasted. They are severely depleted of vitamin A in their peripheral tissues, 
but they may have vitamin A in their liver. Uh, and that's because RBP is pulled from the circulation and sequestered in the in the in the liver in order to be reprogrammed for immune response uh, cascades. Um, so there's a child who has some vitamin A in the liver, little vitamin A in the peripheral tissues. The eyes are going blind. You give that child vitamin A and you reduce his case fatality by about 50%. I did not, maybe one of those weird slides was the, the measles one. Um, but measles case fatality is a beautiful example of reducing uh, what vitamin A can do to reduce that, that risk. Um, will a child handle vitamin A better if they are protein replete? Yes, uh, but that is not a contraindication for um, for providing vitamin A to undernourished children. In fact, they need it more than anyone else. The question about birth defects is a good one. Uh, uh, vitamin A deficiency is an active molecule. And so, um, uh, you know, it is actively differentiating cells. Uh, if you take too much at certain uh, high risk periods where there's a very sensitive point in life, like at the origin of life, there may be an increased risk of birth defects, as we know in animals, at least. Um, however, we also know that deficiency is teratogenic. So it goes both ways. Um, when we talk about supplementing women during pregnancy with um, a nutrient supplement, we're really always talking about a recommended dietary allowance. We're talking about a daily requirement that is known to be very safe and uh, poses really no risk. Uh, that is true with, if you were giving vitamin A as a supplement to women, which does not happen, there's no program that, that does that on a regular basis. Uh, but there is a vast movement going forward right now with micro, multiple micronutrient supplementation uh, during pregnancy. And that uh, has 15 nutrients in it, one of which is vitamin A, but it's providing it at a recommend, at an RDA, a recommended dietary allowance. So there is virtually no risk of, of, uh, uh, of excessive dosage there. Um, We've just completed a trial in Bangladesh, preconceptional, newlywed women being being enrolled into a micronutrient supplement trial um, or uh, uh, where the women get a micronutrient supplement or a control um, placebo uh, before, uh, before their first pregnancy and showing that uh, that kind of an intervention can help reduce miscarriage rates. Uh, and vitamin A is in that supplement. Uh, at a recommended dietary allowance though. So when we talk about normal, uh, when we talk about supplementing women of reproductive age, except for the immediate postpartum period where the risk of pregnancy is virtually nil in the first six weeks, uh, in, which is a program in Indonesia right now, uh, that can be a, a, a large dose, but otherwise it's always about a recommended dietary allowance, a safe amount. Did I answer that okay? Yeah. Okay. Good question. Who who's next? Now that I've got the microphone. Maybe from this side of the classroom, Professor. Do we have question from this side? Come on, don't be shy. Otherwise, you will be able to sleep peacefully tonight. Or this side. I'm on this side. Okay. Or maybe to the fellow lecturers. Do you have question? Silakan, Mbak Dina. I'm looking here. Looking. It's really hard to see a, a curious face with masks on. Yeah, maybe I just want to represent all of the audience here that maybe have some questions as mine. Uh, Professor Kay, thank you very much indeed for the very enlightening presentation. I saw this presentation twice, but I get a new information every time I saw a presentation. That's really amazing. Um, one of my questions is actually about the Pamu Hillel's research about um, to fortify the vitamin A in the MSG. That's really terrific. Um, 
I was just wondering, because I wasn't able to access the full paper, I just access the, the abstract. I was wondering how long the intervention has been going on, had been going on, and how much MSG does actually they consume until they have that effect. And then I was just wondering about how the hemoglobin also improved as well, the hemoglobin, the HB hemoglobin um, for the anemia. Hemoglobin. Hemoglobin, yes. And so answer those two first. Yes, so, yeah, I have lots of them that please okay, thank Don't go away though. Yeah, I'm, I'm here. Um, so that trial went on for 11 months. Uh, in those villages. And um, and the amount that was delivered was around one third of an RDA. So it was laced with really a modest amount, but it was constantly going into the diet uh, on a daily basis because the MSG is used all the time. Um, and uh, so that I think that addresses that. Breast milk levels of vitamin A went up in the breastfeeding moms. Uh, infant mortality went down. And I'm trying to think of anemia, what happened. To, I, and I'd have to go back and look at the papers about the impact on anemia. I would have expected hemoglobins to have gone up. And if you send me an email, I'll send you his papers. That's great. Thank yeah, you. Yeah. <laughs> what is your next question then? Uh, the next one is about the sugar, but I forgot the question, I guess. <laughs> <laughs> I just wrote sugar fortified with vitamin A. Um, just forget about that. I think. And the next one, I think I have more questions maybe after this because we have another session with Kate. I think I would like to give others opinions. Okay. Thank you very much for the inspiring questions, uh, Ibudina. Do we still have more questions? We still have uh, around 10 minutes before wrapping up uh, this event today. Yes. Silakan. Okay, thank you very much. Very inspiring uh, lecture for us today. Uh, I have uh, one question, one burning question actually, uh, regarding uh, you mentioned that the vitamin A supplementation later can be reduced uh, when the fortification and other uh, interventions uh, better. Yeah. Uh, what is your comment about that? Do you think that, uh, I don't know, uh, regarding the fortification, the wheat flour, and also the palm oil, do you think uh, you have uh, any more suggestion? for food to be fortified with vitamin A. Thank you. So uh, it, thank you for that question. Uh, the supplementation uh, every six months, oddly, does not sustain serum retinol levels at a high level. They'll go up for two weeks or four weeks, six weeks, even two months, and then they drift back down again. We really do not know why. It's the mysteries of our biology. Uh, and so we should not use, we cannot use serum retinol levels as an indicator of success for vitamin A supplementation. We know that, and, and the trials are done, we know that it will reduce mortality, xerophthalmia, and these other, these other problems, morbidity problems. So coverage becomes the, the 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 performance indicator for vitamin A supplementation. If you get high coverage, you can expect that public health effect. Um, if you have high coverage and low serum retinol levels, you know, 10, 20% or more of the population is below the cutoff for deficiency, uh, you that's evidence, uh, not against the, the supplement, but that there needs to be more work done on improving diet because studies like the one in India that gave a weekly supplement, which is almost like a diet, uh, drove serum retinol levels up. Um, Pat Muhilal's study drove uh, levels up. In fact, one of those one of those weird slides was a Muhilal slide, uh, but also uh, of... Um, of a slide of uh, MSG fortification in the Philippines by Dr. Florentino Solon and his team uh, there years ago. If you if you start uh, and, and if you follow serum retinol in populations where there is fortification, you can see that serum retinol level creep forward, going to the right, going to the right. Uh, 
uh, over time, over six months, a year, two years, you can see it actually improving in the entire population. And so, um, uh, did I answer your question? What's your question? Uh, the, the, yeah. What? Oh, well, yeah. And how to make the decision to to draw, bring down supplements, uh, supplement use. So um, it's our responsibility in public health nutrition to be monitoring where, what foods are being fortified and how they're being consumed. Because you do not want to over fortify uh, and have very high consumers eating too much in order to get the low consumers to eat more. Um, off, I have not yet seen a situation where that has occurred, but theoretically it can. And so uh, you might have different foods. I think vegetable oil is probably the leading edge right now there are there are problems with vegetable oil being fortified because it's not all branded we heard about this last week um there's branded and unbranded and there's you know and in other countries i mean in bangladesh you still see cows going around this thing and grinding the 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 mustard oil and coming out and that's certainly not fortified um uh but i think vegetable oil is a real is a real possibility uh but we need to realize that you could have oil going in, you know, being fortified, wheat flour being fortified, you know, biofortified crops going in. But some groups may not be eating any of those. You know, a two-year-old child might not be getting any of that. Uh, and so um, it's our responsibility to figure out the epidemiology of programming uh, so that we know who's getting what approximately. There's no perfect information here. Uh, there's always error, but that we have some estimates of what 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 groups are consuming which foods at what levels. Uh, once there is enough of that kind of fortification going on, we've put out recommendations, and it's been taken up by the Global Alliance for Vitamin A Deficiency (GAVA). Uh, initially. Uh, uh, other colleagues and myself wrote a paper about the prevalence should be less than 5% in order to cut back on supplementation. They've said 10%, and I would agree with that. Probably 10% is fine. But you should have a confident estimate below 10%, which means the 90%, say, confidence interval should be less than the 10% mark, not just the point estimate, because you can have a wide confidence interval around a point estimate. So the burden of proof lies with the government. Uh, in, in a population where there's been demonstrated benefit, the government has the responsibility to show uh, with every reasonable effort that uh, the problem does not exist. And there are foods out there being consumed that may plausibly explain why the situation has improved from before. Good questions. Okay, do we, do we have more questions? Um, if not, then actually it's oh, already sure. 4 p.m. <laughs> do we still have questions? Well, there must be one more question. <laughs> Who's got a question here? <laughs> you are looking very curious. <laughs> Go on, don't be shy. I know you have a question. I can see it in your eyes. Are you sure? Okay, thank you for that chance. Maybe I, I wasn't really listening from the beginning, but I do notice that how you said um, vitamin A plays quite a big role in um eyes on eyes so how do you suggest that for us maybe we're the ones who live in a big cities could maintain our vis vision could maintain our vitamins uh vitamin a incomes yeah okay so you know how does this relate to your personal health 
And uh, you are already addressing this problem because you're probably eating a very good diet. And let me look at your conjunctiva here. Yeah, they're really bright eyes. So I don't think you're vitamin A deficient clinically, um, but you are likely to be sufficient. Uh, and so for those of us who are in a well-nourished state, protecting your eyes comes down to getting enough sleep, you know, and, and uh, uh, going to the eye doctor every once in a while to get a checkup. But the vitamin A will not affect your, you know, you are already eating carrots, you are already eating eggs, you are already consuming dairy products so that there's, I would say there's no chance of you being vitamin A deficient or anybody else in this room. But uh, we're really talking about the undernourished, underprivileged populations in rural areas where there's very little meat being consumed, very, you know, very little liver, uh, dairy products are expensive, fish is expensive, and the you know the amounts of food, these sources of vitamin A that are going into the diet of the poor um, may be really meager. And those are the marginalized populations we have to be more concerned about. But um, that's not to say don't stay healthy. You need to stay healthy and continue to eat a good diet because it will protect you from chronic disease later on. Thank you. You did good. <laughs> Thank you very much. Uh, do we have more questions? Oh, we do have one, Professor, at the back. Uh, let me... Terrific. <laughs> Bagus. Uh, so first of all, thank you for letting me speak, even though it's already 4 p.m. Um, I have a question. Okay, I'm I'm glad to know that. So I have a question. It actually stemmed from the fact that you said the fish and other like meat products are actually really expensive, right? So I'm actually coming in from a strategy um, point of view because can we actually implement a system where we actually fix the economic state of uh, the certain marginalized population by giving them subsidiaries or giving them a certain amount of money to buy like eggs at least for the very least or meats or at least liver, chicken liver or beef liver. Because even though like we have this stigma that, um, oh, Carrots are really high in vitamin A, even though they're really actually high in pro-vitamin A, right? Pro-vitamin A can be turned into vitamin A, but it's not actually as good as ingesting actual vitamin A. So what I'm saying here is, can we actually fix, uh, aim to fix the economic state of these marginalized people alongside of the um, supplementation to expect a trickle-down effect to come to those marginalized population where they can actually sustain themselves and they have a better income possibly to actually fix their own diets. Because if we expect them to have, you know, fix their own diets just by themselves, they'd probably have like thinking that they probably have thoughts like, oh, carrots are enough or squash or cantaloupes because they, those foods do contain pro-vitamin A's, but they're, they don't contain vitamin A. So could we actually implement a new strategy where we have an economic standpoint adding into this public health crisis and actually support them financially to fix their dietary, in, you know, dietary... Uh... Wow. Are you in the doctoral program? Well, you just enunciated a doctoral thesis. <laughs> she should apply to the doctoral program immediately. <laughs> um, so when in, during the 2008 economic cra crisis, um, there were a, a number of papers that were written. I, I penned one um, on what happens to the diet diets of the poor when there's an economic crisis. And it does go down. It, the, the amount of carotenoid consuming foods and, and dairy products all start to go down 
there's more rice being being consumed because it's you have to fill your bellies and a uh, limited amount of money will you know if you're going to if you're hungry you're going to buy more rice and not and not the vegetables um but your question is excellent because there are cash transfer programs that are being tried out they're not being evaluated against nutritional outcomes like we're talking about right now but um there are um there are studies around the world going on right now with by um uh, wfp the world food program called cost of diet uh where markets are being visited what does it cost to provide a the least expensive highly nutritious foods that can cover the requirements of the poor uh there needs to be a lot more of that and that's observational but at some point there needs to be an intervention there needs to be interventions that can lead to more eggs in the market to be purchased um a, a grant that didn't get funded that we were going to try in bangladesh was uh to subsidize um uh uh, families, young families, new families, uh, newlywed families, um, with um, a card that would give them eggs at half the price, uh, other foods at half the price, just to create this economic incentive to, uh, like it's it's like a food stamp, except it was just a card that participating stores would would uh, would uh, honor. Uh, there needs to be trials done to show how you can change the economic um, purchasing power of the poor and how that leads to specifically an increase in nutritious foods with usually um, communi uh, behavior and communications and, and intervention. Because if you just give the money, they might be buying these poofies, you know, these salty, sweet, and fatty snack foods that, you know, they may have a picture of a vegetable on them, but no vegetable was ever killed making them. Uh, and, uh, and so how to combine cash transfers and economic assets that are targeting the poor, plus behavioral uh, in interventions that can raise the the awareness and the demand for those foods such that the markets respond. It's a big question, but it is at the heart of the solution. So I don't have an answer, but you have the chance of providing that answer in the next 30 years. In your doctoral thesis, maybe, Professor. Yeah? <laughs> okay, thank you very much for uh, the excellent question. Uh, maybe I would like to ask the last time, do we still have one final question? Oh, we do have one more still, Professor, from the gentleman in the back. Yes. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Oh, gitu. Ada yang lain lagi ya? Okay, boleh, boleh. Yes. So, uh, I would like to give my opinion regarding the question mentioned by her. So first of all, the question is about, uh, can we elevate uh, <laughs> the family economy so that we can address the VAD? So I believe that if we talk about the VAD, it's an issue from the WHO, and we have to know about the mandate itself. In UN, there's a lot of uh, consult, and WHO don't have the mandate to... Uh, to tackle economy issue. If you want to talk about economy, in, we need to refer it to the United Nations Development Program or about the Economic and Social Council so that I believe that if we are in the WHO Council, which is we're talking about the VAD, we can address about the economy. And the second, I believe that in WHO, the principle itself is the sustainability and also the empowerment. So if we give people funds without uh, make them, without empowering them, it won't be a sustainable solution. So that's why till now, uh, the cash transfer hasn't been a solution by the WHO. So uh, I believe that that's to answer that maybe can be can make it clear regarding her question. Thank you. Excellent. <laughs> Um, Professor, I'm so sorry that we already exceeding the time, but we do have more questions. Are you okay with that, Professor? There's a young lady over there. Yes. Yes. 
Uh, okay, thank you for the opportunity. Uh, I'm sorry if we exceeded uh, the time. Don't be sorry. Okay. I'm going nowhere. <laughs> uh, okay, my question is, um, you said uh, beta, carot beta carotene has a specific ratio uh, for it to be absorbed in the body, right? Uh, 12 to 1 ratio. Uh, my question is uh, about the cooking oil. So um, on our third Sorry, semester... Sorry, question about what? Cooking oil, cooking oil. Oh, yeah. Oil. Uh, my question is about oh, the oil. cooking oil. Uh, does it act as an agent to increase the bioavailability of the vitamin A? Or is it an agent to break down all the fibers on leafy green vegetables for it to be absorbed in the body? Yes. Uh, which one? Both. <laughs> oh, oh, okay. So, uh, the uh, the fortification on vitamin A is used to increase the bioavailability, and also to could and also the cooking oil is to break down all the fibers so it could be absorbed in the body. All of those are plaus biologically plausible pathways that, if they are not functioning at a proper level can lead to improved vitamin A nutriture in the body and, and sustain the health that we're looking for. Um, you mentioned red palm, oil, red palm oil, I think. Did you did you mention palm oil? No. No. I didn't hear you. Oh, I thought I said, you know, there's red palm oil is a very good source of, of beta carotene, but nobody likes the flavor. Uh, and so the, the carotenoid gets stripped out of that oil uh, to make it more palatable uh, and a vehicle that could otherwise provide some valuable beta carotene because carotenoid in oil is best absorbed that way um, is actually not there uh, and uh, because of because of consumer preferences and and flavor issues. Oh, okay, thank you very much. And I have a second question. Is it okay? Okay. Um, um, is this is just my cur curiosity about the MSG, MSG fortification? Um, the data, if I'm not mistaken, it shows forty four percent on redu reduction on child mortality. If I'm not wrong, um, so why does it not? Uh, why does it not used in Indonesia? Why? Why do we? Uh, why? Why does the government? program only used on only on supplementation and not on MSG fortification. So MSG is a private product uh, and, you know, it's profit driven uh, and it was the choice of the company not to proceed. Uh, and so I will, you know, it, it, it's complicated. Uh, it's part of the challenges of implementation. You can do a beautiful trial and show that it has a public health impact, but if it's going to alter the, the economics of a product that is established, branded and consumed and a major product of a company, they're, they're, they, they may not cooperate and there's not much the government can do to to force that issue. Okay, thank you very much. And on my last question, I've seen you done very much research. Um, how do you make uh, all the people there, uh, especially on the villages in Aceh and like um, very, very small villages to trust you, to trust you to uh, give them supplements that it makes them better? Uh, how do you do that? So how, do, how did we... Um, develop a trusted relationship yes. with the, that's a very good question. Um, and it's not only relevant to Ache, it's relevant to every community-based survey, but more than surveys, intervention trials, because survey is sort of a one-off kind of thing and, and you're not intervening. Uh, uh, there, is, there is a need to uh, respect the traditional uh, um, uh, conveyance of authority and trust in rural and traditional societies. And so tradition is handed down from authority to, to those who trust that authority. It also goes from generation to generation, uh, and that forms this basis of tradition, which is believed with deeply uh, by, by, you know, by societies. Um, what we have learned, and this was, we applied this in the Ache study as well, is that you need to have discussions uh, amongst the leadership 
not only the political leadership, but the cultural leadership uh, of a region uh, in order to establish a dialogue and to start to create that dialogue that can move through the system uh, about what an intervention trial should be. So for example, I forget how long it took in Aceh. Uh, it was probably a few months to of discussions uh, with the leaders in um, in Cabo Patansigli and Luxemaui, which is where the study was actually done. Uh, but in other places in Bangladesh and Nepal, it has taken one to two years uh, to have dialogues uh, with leaders, leaders, women's groups, teachers groups, returned military groups, uh, the you know the governing councils and so forth, and the press uh, to have these discussions before you ever approach a household and a, a mother for informed consent. So it, it really you're talking about informed consent. How does that roll out? Uh, in traditional societies, and it has multiple phases to it. Uh, you could never walk into, you know, a kampung in, in, in Aceh and go to a household, especially a Westerner, uh, and go to a household and, and uh, you know, read an informed consent and ask them to be in a study. That process is a hierarchical process and it takes it takes months to even a couple of years to establish that trust. Um, once a study begins, you know, after you've gone through that process, there's always still the um, opportunity and the mandate for a mother or a mother on behalf of her child to refuse to be in a study uh, or to say yes and voluntarily not answer a question or stop being in the study at any time. And that information has to be conveyed very clearly uh, in the informed consent process in order to respect the um, uh, uh, the auto autonomy uh, of individuals. Uh, and that autonomy in traditional societies is shared. It's not, it's not an individual, it is you know, the wife, the, the husband has part of that wife's autonomy. The parents have some of that autonomy. The village head has to share some of that responsibility. And that's how, that's how one has to approach the communities as well. And then you have to have ombudsmen in, you know, working in the communities to pick up any complaints when a trial is underway so that they can be addressed in a timely and fair way. And there are times when, you know, we don't do things entirely right. You know, some workers may not, you know, understand their own procedures properly and things don't go well for a while. Uh, and so staying on top of that issue and always being transparent uh, is is the way that we are able to to proceed. Okay. Good question. Thank you very much, Professor. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Kanisa, for your question. Um, we do still have question, Professor. Do you mind? <laughs> there is a question from Ibu Ai, if I'm not mistaken. Ibu Ai, do, do you still have your question with you? Uh, this is actually showing you the spirit of FKM, Professor, because we do have a very engaged and very actively participating audience. Um, there's a question from Ibu Ai. Ibu Ai is a staff. Oh, sorry. From yeah. <laughs> Go ahead with your question, please. Uh, thank you very much. Um, I will not make you thinking so much, Professor, because <laughs> you have answered uh, many questions before. Uh, I just curious, I want to know how were your feeling uh, because of you? Uh, we are here get vitamin A and uh, maybe uh, children in the world uh, get vitamin E because of your study. How are you feeling? Thank you. Thank you. Uh, it feels uh, very, very rewarding. Uh, you know, when you carry out a study, you do not understand its implications. You don't even know what the findings are going to be. All you can do is follow the um, the principles of science 
the respect for society, the autonomy that is needed to engage in the community. Uh, the ethics are important. The, the biological plausibility is important. But with all of that, you still do not know what the findings are going to be. Uh, and it was when the Aceh findings were first analyzed and um, became evident to Dr. Somer and myself, uh, we were astounded, astounded. We could not, you know, the data are what the data were, uh, and it made it made complete sense, but it was very exciting. And to be able to confirm it in other settings was very exciting. Uh, and uh, and so it's been it's been very rewarding. and it it made me realize as a doctoral candidate uh, that, nutrition can be an exciting science. And we have many essential nutrients that are in need of attention and many, many dietary components that are absent in the diets of the poor that can have a very measurable impact on health, function, cognition, development, survival. Uh, and go forth. I would encourage everybody here to be a scientist, a nutrition scientist, and to carry out research that can answer questions in Indonesian society. And you never know where it's going to go, you know, because Indonesia has provided many examples of local research being taken up by the world. And, uh, and it's really a, a, a thrill to be part of that story. Thank you. Yeah. Yeah, uh, Prof. Kit, uh, I guess my question would be, <laughs> don't go away, please. <laughs> yeah, I guess my question would be related with uh, Nadira's question before. So uh, as a young faculty, I often get questions from the students, like students who is going to uh, start their thesis uh, or their uh, final task for their uh, graduate uh, undergraduate program, right? And sometimes they ask like, how to start doing the research? How to identify what would be worth the effort to do the research, right? And then uh, because every one of us is actually, uh, no matter at which level we are right now, yeah. the students, uh, those who just enter the program, the young faculty, seniors, what we're trying to do is actually make our way to give impact to the society, right? But when it comes to research, sometimes we get boundaries. We get uh, like, <laughs> because I started my career as a researcher instead of faculty. So uh, when I have this idea, then what comes immediately is the difficulties. Oh, I would need a lot of samples. I don't have the data available. I don't have the money. I don't have the time. And maybe that's what we are all thinking. Yeah. So I would like to get your word of wisdom. <laughs> yeah, for us as a young uh, starter. Yes, in this that is a great, Thank you. It's a great uh, comment and question. Um, so if you are standing in the middle of a circle, uh, and that circle represents all the interests in the in your world. And if you are interested in all of them, you're not going to ever get off that circle uh, because you never know what direction to go. Uh, develop some interests in areas that you find you find that you are passionate about. Uh, and read, read critique and become an expert in that area. Know the literature in that area uh, and start to think about how it relates to communities that you are familiar with uh, that could benefit from that knowledge being applied to action. Um, it's true, research requires usually more than yourself. 
you have to collaborate. And so networking is another issue. Uh, you know, I, I would never trust myself in a laboratory uh, uh, to measure serum. You know, we, we have to de depend on other colleagues who will know much more about it than, than I will. Uh, and so you build a network of people who are social scientists, who may be who are capable in a laboratory setting uh, to start an interest group around certain issues. Um, frequently, you will you will not hit pay dirt on the first idea with a funder, but you might get a small grant uh, from a an agency or a funder for a problem that you have researched, and that you can show that there's some evidence of that problem being being present in the community you know that is present in any area of the of the country uh at the same time build your connections upward uh you know discuss with older faculty with faculty in other universities to build that knowledge and that insight into how one would go about carrying out a study. Your first study will never be your best. It'll never be your best study. Your best at work is to come, uh, but you have to start somewhere. And with meager resources, you're going to have limitations to the work. Recon part of the education is recognizing your limitations, recognizing the limitations of the study uh, hopefully it has some strengths, but there will always be questions about validity of a question that you're asking, or the sample size is not large enough, or, um, you know, it, the study didn't go long enough. Uh, there, there's lots of, you know, you didn't ask the right kinds of socioeconomic questions or dietary questions, but you have to start somewhere. And uh, the more you know about the basic techniques of dietary assessment, anthropometry, socioeconomic variables that are used widely in surveys that you can adapt, um, and that you have continued to read up on the problems that are emerging, and we're in a post-COVID situation here. There, there may be new problems that are emerging that we don't really know about stay abreast of those issues. An example, vitamin E. Vitamin E, if you read the textbooks, vitamin E deficiency is said to be rare. It's only occurring in the textbooks uh, in people who, are, who have genetic mutations in alpha tocopherol transfer protein in the liver, which allows vitamin E to leave the liver and go into the bloodstream and bathe the tissues. Well, that actually is not true. Um, we've, for example, in our work in Nepal and Bangladesh, we're finding 60% of children and mothers to be vitamin E deficient. And the question is, how? why isn't that been found out before? And we think part of it has to do with vegetable oil. Oil that the oil comes from so many different sources. And it's when it is sold in the markets, it's in plastic bags hanging off the post, being drenched by UV light, you know, being soaked by the sun, destroying the vitamin E. I showed you a, a, a table of, of oil intake going up. It's going up in many countries. <laughs> But the, there are questions about the quality of that oil. And maybe part of the nutrition transition of eating more oil is actually creating a new deficiency on vitamin E. The oil is going in, the polyunsaturated oil is going in, the vitamin E is not. Vitamin E is also destroyed by cooking. <coughs> People save oil, they cook it to death. And so, um, the oils continue to go in in less vitamin E. So there may be new nutrition problems <clears throat> that are emerging in the population that you should be aware of. And that can lead to some questions as well. I don't have a good answer for you other than to 
persist, persevere, don't give up. Let failure give you a sense of pride to keep going, right? Thank you very much, Professor Keith, for the very interactive uh, question and answer. Thank you very much for being so energetic. You really spread out the energy to the classroom. And also thank you for the audiences, for uh, the active questions. <laughs> you really show Professor Keith the spirit of FKM, and I hope that you can maintain the spirit. Um, I'm so sorry that we are exceeding uh, the time for half an hour already. Uh, before we close uh, this event, I would like to invite Ibu Asi, our Vice Dean. Uh, we have a little souvenir for you, Professor. Not much, but we hope you like it. <laughs> Please, Ibu Asi. <laughs> wow. <laughs> We'll make a selfie picture so that all audiences can also be included in the picture. <laughs> How about it? Yeah. Uh, do you mind, students who are in this side of the tribune and also in that side of the tribune, do you mind go to the middle so we can have a picture with all of us in it, please? Uh, and also maybe to remind you that there is an attendance list. So if you haven't filled in the attendance list, please kindly do so. Ke tengah ya, adik-adik, yuk ke tengah yuk yang di tribun sisi sini sama tribun sisi sana, kita ke tengah, mau foto bareng biar semuanya kelihatan ya. Nyobain, nyobain, nyobain. Yuk, maju turun ke bawah, boleh? Gak apa-apa, ibu di sini. Ibu di sini, jadi barang. Di waro-waro. Ada ada yang di belakang turun yuk, ditunggu ya. Yuk, yang di belakang turun ke bawah. Di samping Bu Arifa, nih. Kata Bu Arifa yang mau kelihatan lebih singset, boleh di depan. Ya, ya. Yuk, yang di belakang yuk. Boleh maju ke depan nih, masih ada dua bangku lagi. Di samping Pak Kasno masih ada tiga lagi. 
Di bawah lagi. Uh, kalau ada yang mau nitip HP satu boleh. Yuk, yang belum dapat bangku sini dua. Terus di samping Pak Kasno ada satu, dua, tiga. Depan Pak Kasno masih ada satu, dua lagi. Di pangku Bu Arifah boleh. <laughs> ayo ayo jangan malu-malu yuk 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 oke <laughs> you might have to get a <laughs> uh, yeah. Yeah. <laughs> Badina mau asis Badina belum tahu foto Uh, professor, if we are done with the photo session, we are still waiting for your bungong jumpa. <laughs> uh, we, I mean, in this uh, event, we know that Professor Keith is not only a scientist, but also a singer. <laughs> uh, and guitarist as well. So, do you mind singing us the song? <laughs> yes. Bunong <laughs> I need more words. <laughs> Yeah. Uh, thank you very much again, Professor, for being so inspiring and so entertaining for today. <laughs> it is an honor for us to have you here in FKM. Thank you again. And also thank you, audiences, for staying with us until uh, 40 minutes past the event. Um, we will see you again in the next opportunity. Uh, I hope you enjoy the rest of your evening. Thank you very much. And wassalamualaikum warahmatullahi wabarakatuh.